I'm about to invite Elizabeth Wainwright, who's going to speak about what she's learned through listening, both in international development and in her own life. And before I do, I also want to tell you she's got a very special skill, which is she knows how to drive a tractor. So when she comes on, a massive round of applause for Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah. So a massive round of um, applause for Elizabeth. Jeffrey, I'm really happy to talk about tractors with anyone afterwards, <laughs> if you're interested. Um, thanks so much. I've had a great day so far, and I hope all of you have as well. Um, how many of you have ever been in a group of people, and everyone's talking and talking, and yet you don't feel heard? It's like no one's listening. Or maybe you're um, talking with someone, and and you're kind of pouring out your heart, but you see that they're off somewhere else in their head thinking about dinner or EastEnders or whatever. Have you ever experienced that? How does it feel? Not good. Yeah. Alone, uh huh. Yeah. Thanks. It's really frustrating, isn't it, actually? Mm. It's really frustrating when you don't feel listened to, when people don't hear your voice. Um, but actually beyond frustration, I think that um, not listening can be harmful and I'd like to talk a little bit about how. Um, so very recently I was in southern, uh, southern Africa in a country called Zambia that I know very well. I used to live there for some time, love the place. Um, and I was with a charity that I co-lead called Community Health Global Network or CHGN. And, um, I was in with, sitting with a community that we work with there. Um, so think kind of stereotypical images. There were mud huts, uh, sand, dust, trees. And we were sitting under one of these trees and we were talking about hopes and about challenges that this community were facing. Um, and I was hearing about maternal health and malaria and all the things that I know are main causes of poverty and um, sad things in this area. But then I asked a question, I said, if you could change one thing right now, what would you change? Well, one woman said, the crocodiles. The crocodiles, I echoed. Yes, she says, they are causing havoc. So she went on to explain to me that because um, a crocodile farm way up country could no longer find a global market for crocodile skin. They decided the best thing to do would be to release all these crocodiles into the wild. So these crocs found their way down the watercourse into this massive lake around which all the communities live. And, um, and that's where they were. She said, the woman said, yeah, it's a nightmare. They're taking our animals, they're taking our livestock. And then she said something which just hit me here. She said, they're even taking our children. And if that wasn't enough, she said something which lodged here. She said, I know all you charities have your plans and we're used to working with those and hearing those, but if it was up to us, we would change the crocodiles. That's what we would change. She said, but nobody ever really asked us what we think. Nobody asked them. Nobody had asked them so far what they thought. And sure enough, then everybody else in the group started chipping in and said, yes, yes, yeah, the crocodiles, it's a nightmare, let's <coughs> do something about it. It was the most pressing, pressing issue this community were facing. <coughs> the crocodiles are nowhere to be seen on official agendas for the, for the area. Um, they're not kind of highlighted as a main priority area. But because of the crocodiles, these communities couldn't safely get water. And in an area that's really affected by drought, that's a serious issue. It affects nutrition and health and sanitation and other things. So uh, with the charity that I co-lead, we've been listening to this community and co-discovering solutions together. And these have uh, included things like <coughs> talking to the Ministry of Fisheries, um, dreaming up irrigation schemes, even thinking, how can we eat the crocodiles for meat? Crocodile is quite tasty, actually. Um, 
So this community um, have now invited us to continue working with them. And their kind of, their, this brilliant approach of just pioneering and leading has cascaded out into other things. They're tackling maternal health, teenage pregnancies, um, and we're continuing with them. And it's all started because we listened and we um, trusted that this community knew best, you know, their own situation and what was best for them. Now, I know this all might sound actually very simple. Is it really as easy as just going and asking people what they want and saying, great, yep, here you go. Well, of course, it's more complex than that. But, but at its heart, it's something about listening and really being present with a community or an individual or whoever it might be and starting from a place of strength. And we've seen that these are the things that lead to really meaningful change. And actually, a colleague of mine who um, has just taken on the, the world's longest job title, I need to read out, it, he's taken on the role of the director of the World Health Organization's Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health Department. <laughs> His business card is like... This. And he was recently <laughs> asked a question just a couple of weeks ago. And this is the question he was asked. No, not that one. He was asked, what single change has made the biggest difference in your field? Now, this is a guy who's been there, he's done it, he's got the job title to prove it. And just have a think, what do you think his response might be? Is it like a, a technical solution? Is it more money? What might it be? Just hold that question in your head. Well, actually, what he said was this. This is the thing that has made the biggest difference to him and his work. He said, the recognition of the importance of empowering local people to transform their own health. And we've seen again and again with, it, with this charity that empowerment begins by listening and by being heard. So for us, empowerment is something about listening, being present with um, and respecting. So, this community in Zambia, this one, these are the guys that we work with. And it just incidentally, this, the guy in white, he's now a good friend of mine, uh, a Zambian guy called Matthews. He's got the most beautiful singing voice. And he sings kind of like classical opera songs. It's very beautiful, but once we were um, sitting, waiting to go into some meeting with the Ministry of Health, and he just started singing in his kind of classical voice. Wannabe by the Spice Girls. <laughs> and then he was just nodding his head at the end, and he, and he just went, girl power. <laughs> and then we went into this meeting. <laughs> it's very surreal. But he's brilliant. He's a, he's a real dude. So this community in Zambia, um, they're now on a totally different path. So much so that the government and um, national health bodies have recognised something really good is happening here, and it's being led by the community and they want to now take this approach and kind of share it more widely in the country. So the outsiders, that's us. We've just come on board as uh, connectors, facilitators. We plug gaps in knowledge where that might be the case. Um, we match make and make good links. But we, really we start with the premise that communities can and should own their futures. And actually when I think about my own story, um, if I hadn't listened in to, my <coughs> to my inner voice, I would not be here today and I'd be on a totally different path. Because 14 years ago, I was training to be a doctor. Um, and I went to Zambia for the very first time volunteering basic health skills. Um, and I got there. And I really started to see the world, I think, for the first time. And I, um, it just left a mark with me. I realized that whilst health and medicine is vital and it changes lives, people need other things. They need... Um, healthy environments, they need education, they need to be heard, they need to think that somebody believes in who they are and what they're capable of. Um, and my emerging intuition said, there's something here I need to pay attention to and take seriously for my own life. So kind of fast forward two years, I came back from Zambia, I'd quit medicine and I was on a different path in international development, which I sort of thought was a good way of creating change. Um, actually, my master plan was to become someone very important at the United Nations. 
But uh, since then, I've, I've lived and I've worked in Africa and in other places, and um, I've taken a different route. And it reminds me a bit of um, Sheryl Sandberg in her book, Lean In. I don't know if any of you have read that. But in that, she talks about the idea of, sort of well-accepted idea that we, we got career ladders. And actually, I didn't really like that idea, that kind of staring up at the backside of the person in front of you and climbing. And actually, I really like her, her kind of idea of a jungle gym where we get to swing and play and explore and jump on and jump off. And really, that's kind of what my life has, uh, it looks like now. So let's just go back to Africa and to Kenya this time, where I um, came across another example of what happens when people don't listen. So I was in rural Kenya, um, and I wondered why people were struggling with waterborne disease when I'd seen a number of boreholes and wells that had been dug. So I asked that question, and the community said, well, this well-known NGO came with lots of money, and they said they were going to build wells, and we said, thanks very much, but please do not dig them there, because over there, there are bad spirits. We don't go there. It's not a good place. Uh, but the wells were dug there anyway. And now, the wells aren't being used. The community choose to use the river still, where there may be waterborne disease, but there are no bad spirits. So for us, that said, you know, culture and tradition is really powerful, and we need to listen for that. Um, and I know from my own experience it's complex and there's no easy answers, but, but I do know that if you listen and sit down with people, you know, the right solutions come about. Maybe it's like what Steph was saying with the sandbanks, I think you were, you know, maybe that would have served as things well, better, I don't know. Um, but, but there's a problem there. Um, and, and even just three weeks ago, I was in um, Sierra Leone and I was talking with um, the, one of the health coordinators in the government. And he had been kind of key when Ebola hit the nation very recently. And um, it, oh, it was a devastating time. And he said how grateful he and his country was um, for all the support that they had. He said, but yet I have a challenge. He said, you know, I know my country, we had our plans, but all these agencies came in and they did their own thing. They didn't talk to each other very well and they certainly didn't listen to me. How am I supposed to work like that? You know, you can't only follow your own agenda, you've got to work together. And in all the reports and things we're reading post Ebola, this is coming out, that you've got to listen, you've got to work in harmony, and that's what we're trying to do. So whether you're a village, somewhere in Africa, or an NGO deciding what projects to work on, or a nation trying to tackle something like Ebola, we know that listening is vital. And so in Kenya and Zambia and elsewhere around the world, CHGN connects communities, helps unlock their potential, and really listen in to you know, what they're capable of and what's right for them. We call these groups clusters, um, and they're choosing to just own their futures and then create change for themselves. We come alongside, we challenge, we connect, we train. Increasingly, we coach, actually. And that's a really exciting strand of work I'd love to talk to you about at another date. Um, OK, so I need to be wrapping up. So what? Like, why is listening so important in uh, development and beyond? Well, I think for three main reasons. One, I think, um, like we've heard from some other talks today, um, but in my context, international development, I think uh, I, think, I think the sector's in trouble. I think um, that, so I'm not talking about kind of humanitarian aid, so in disasters when people need help, it's really important. But the ongoing development of communities and countries, um, I think we need to kind of rethink how we do that. Um, there's, a, there's a great Zambian economist called Dambi Samoyo, and she says, the four horsemen of Africa's apocalypse are war, poverty, corruption, and disease. And I think, sadly, these have become the face of Africa. But I don't think they're going to be solved by charity alone. I think we need a new narrative of community-led change, of leaders who listen, um, and of communities owning their own futures. And I think us outsiders, we need to think of ourselves as 
people that can be invited into a process, not as people that go and solve and fix and tell, but rather people that serve and listen and work <coughs> with. Secondly, in, in our communities, I think, you know, we need to listen more. We, need, we all need to be heard. And I think that when we really hear ourselves and others, good things happen. And I see this through um, the, the charity in Africa and Asia, the work we do. I see this through my own coaching work with clients and communities. Um, listening is vital. And lastly, the kind of inner level. I think listening to that inner voice is so important. Like the voice that said to me, quit medicine and take the unknown path. And that's what I did, and it was a bit scary, but now I'm having a brilliant time, and, you know, life is fun. Um, and I think that's where our best selves get to come out and play, when we really listen to who we are and what we're saying, and that inner voice. So lastly, I realised that my dreams of, you know, working in the UN were great, but they weren't what I needed, and wasn't what the world needed. And I know a lot more about crocodiles than I ever thought I would. Um, something I love about events like this is you get to meet lots of great people and connect with brilliant people who are doing wonderful things. But I don't know what challenges and opportunities you're going to go back to when you leave the room today. So if you like, I would just invite you just to think about these things as you leave. I think it's good to um, just be motivated by your curiosity, your outrage. Um, and your passions. I think we need to honour those things. Passions, outrage, curiosity. I know those things have kind of got me to where I am today. And they're key for creating change, actually. I think we need to listen to ourselves more deeply. Um, and I think we need to listen to our communities and the global narrative as well. I think that's important. We need to ask more questions. <laughs> Um, and once we've listened, we need to make noise and we need to create change, however we're called to create change. Listen into your inner voice and act on what it says. So I'd love to carry on this conversation with you. Um, CHGN is looking for practical help, volunteers, financial backing so that we can uh, expand our model and kind of help create a new development paradigm, actually. And um, more well, personally, I love working with uh, communities, change makers, so please come and talk to me about that. Um, if any of what I've said has resonated with who you are and where you're at. Um, and as Jeffrey has already mentioned, um, we've got a little leaflet, Kat and I, about a, a nature coaching workshop that we're running. It's a bit of a playful experimentation, but um, we love nature. So just invite you to find out a bit more and come on board. But really, just thanks for being here, please. Keep listening to this and to this and to this and beyond, and I think only good things will happen. So thanks for listening to me today. Come and join me. Thanks. So thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and your insights. My pleasure. Um, yeah, it sounds like you did massive work and you come across so humbly. Oh, thanks. Yes. Well, yeah, I'm doing it with like, a great team of people, um, brilliant volunteers, and just, yeah, people that think that change is possible and that getting off their butts and making it happen. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And I'm also happy to hear that, you know, although you chose not to climb that ladder, you're still having a brilliant time. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, it's great fun swinging and playing and <laughs> jumping and, you know, falling down and grazing your knee and getting back up again. It's good, definitely. Brilliant. Okay, so my question is going to be about your nature workshop. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about it. Um, well, do read the leaflet, but um, I have a real passion for wild spaces and wilderness and conservation and environment, and I'm really inspired by nature. Um, I love the ocean and the moors and you know anything wild. I love it. Um, so that was my motivation. And cat, cat, I know is really. Um, she loves nature and wild spaces too, so it was really just kind of um, playing with that um, and just enjoying the Mo community and wanting to kind of you know kick something off with this community. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, have we got any questions from the group? Any questions from the floor? So we've got a couple. 
Got one from Romario. I just wanted to ask if he was religious. Um, I'm not religious. I'd say I, I follow a kind of contemplative Christian um, uh, kind of mindset, really. So I enjoy thinking and reflecting and reading and meditation and prayer, but not kind of the stereotype religious, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. And I think we have another question from Nicole. Yeah, just about the nature coaching. Um, what can we get out of it if we can join you? Cool. Well, please come and find us um, at the end. Um, but I think really it's about connecting with ourselves, each other, um, being <coughs> prompted by patterns and perspectives and, and just kind of putting ourselves in a different environment um, and being inspired by wonder and, and nature rather than kind of laptops and whatever other stuff. Yeah. So guys, massive round of applause for Elizabeth.